Welcome everyone. My name is Janet Lucas and I am the Inclusion and Diversity and Campus Manager at Direct Supply and a current member of the Emerging Women Leaders and the Women's Affinity Alliance Advisory Board. Thank you for joining us for our quarterly session in WAVE program this afternoon. Before we begin, we wanna take a moment to thank our WAVE corporate sponsor, MGIC but we also wanna acknowledge our 17 corporate partners as well. Thank you for your continued support. Before we get started, I would like to take a few moments just to provide a little history about the Women's Affinity Alliance, since we have many guests here today. First of all, we were founded in 2011 as a Tempo initiative. Our members are corporate and individuals, but we also have Tempo members and non-Tempo members as well. The mission of the Alliance is to connect ERG leaders and stakeholders and provide them with networking and access to best practices to bring back to their organizations and grow their female talent. In addition, we provide quarterly sessions, we do networking opportunities, and then we also provide additional information that you can use um, as you lead your ERGs. But to learn more about our um, Women's Affinity Alliance, please go to our um, Tempo website. Now, the topic of our session today is very exciting. It's gender innovations, reimagining what's possible through your ERG. Gender innovations is a term derived from the Korea Foundation of Women's Science and Technology. The definition is using sex gender analysis as a tool to create new knowledge and develop innovative technologies. And I know as members and leaders of your ERGs, we are always looking to find strategic ways in which our individual groups can make a direct impact on the business. And I am sure today, after hearing from our experts, you will leave here recharged and even with some key takeaways that give you ideas for exploring a multitude of possibilities. Without further ado, I am excited to turn over today's session to Katherine Klaus and Jennifer Tarpley from Kohler and the Women at Work Business Resource Group. But we will give you a few minutes for questions at the end of this session. So if you think of any questions during or throughout the session, please feel free to um, put them in the chat because we also will be monitoring the chat. And you can also send me a direct message. But we'll also be doing something a little differently. As you all um, responded to the first link, the menti.com, we, we will also be taking questions through that link as well. So please feel free to use either method. And so now we will hear from our guests, Catherine and Jennifer, take it away. Right. Okay. Can everybody, can somebody just verify you can hear me and see my screen? I can hear yes. you. All right. <laughs> We're good to go. Um, so thanks for joining today. Jennifer and I are excited uh, to, to talk to you a little bit about a journey that we've been on over the, the past 18 months or so. Um, I'm Catherine Klaus. I'll get us kicked off. And I wanna just as a reminder, and for those who are just joining, encourage you to go to this mentee site, use the code. We do have a few interactive questions so that we can learn a little bit more about all of you as we go through our presentation. Um, and that first question is really helping us get grounded in what type of industry are we in? Um, so hopefully this is updating live for you, it's updating live for me, but as your questions are coming in, I'm seeing you know, that we have a lot of people here from consumer services, we have consumer products, business to business services, one business to business manufacturing product and other. And I know it, it can be hard to choose like, oh, which one do I most fit with? Um, but, but yeah, we'd encourage you to try to pick the right one because we kind of want to understand where you're coming from entering into this conversation. And while these are rolling in, um, I would again, just echo what Janet said about using the Q&A feature in Menti as you have questions throughout our presentation. I believe you'll have the opportunity to give them a thumbs up. Like if you already see another question that somebody asked and you think, oh yeah, that's a good question. I'd really like to um, hear that answered. Then we can work with that 
uh, you can thumb it up and make sure that it gets put to the top. And I'm hoping this goes away. All right. So thank you all for taking the time to answer that question. I'm going to keep us going here. And I'm glad to see that we have a lot of people in a consumer-based industry, um, but really hoping that you, the people who maybe aren't tied directly to a consumer will get some valuable insights and lessons on this as well. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into content, starting a little bit about um, myself and then Jennifer can introduce herself as well. Like I said, I'm Katherine Klaus. Currently, I'm the Advanced Development Program Manager for Kitchen and Bath, so it's an engineering function at the very front end of product development. Um, we like to work in the fuzzy, fuzzy front end in advanced development and consider ourselves an essential part of innovation at Kohler. I'm also the Women at Work Kitchen and Bath North America president and the founder of our gendered innovations workstream within the BRG. I have a bachelor in, in engineering mechanics from UW-Madison and, and an MBA from UW-Oshkosh. So that's all of the credentials. Um, but the unofficial story of Catherine Klaus is that I'm also a wife and a mother. Um, I garden to practice patience um, or to take out anger on weeds. <laughs> I am an inventor. Um, I practice yoga for physical and mental wellness. And I would term myself as a rebel with a cause. So always having kind of the slow burn and push for progress type of mentality. Um, a little bit about my story and my journey. As I am an engineer by background, but I did take on a stretch opportunity in 2016 into our corporate human resources department to um, really establish the diversity and inclusion program at Kohler at that time. Um, and one of my major deliverables that I, I was there for two and a half years. Uh, certainly, if you ever want to connect on the why I made that transition, we can talk about that offline. But um, it goes back to that rebel with a cause type of uh, title. Anyway, one of my main deliverables in this program as we were getting it established was to establish business resource groups at Kohler Company, which became a, a pivotal um, portion of this journey that has led to the development of, of gendered innovations and how I've really worked to tie the engineering competency into diversity and inclusion practice. Um, in 2019, I did transition back into engineering, this time within our kitchen and bath organization. Previously, I had worked at our power systems organization, but when I wanted to go back into the engineering field, I wanted it to be in a consumer-based industry because I wanted to, for, for many different reasons, but one of which I wanted to see um, and accelerate the realization of what was possible with our business resource groups in the space of consulting on product development. So I will pause and Jennifer, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. So my name is Jennifer Tarpley. I'm currently a senior staff engineer also in advanced development and kitchen and bath. I am the current gendered innovations committee lead. Um, credential wise, I hold a bachelor's and a master's in mechanical engineering from Purdue. Like all of you, I have a life outside of work and wear a lot of hats. So I'm a wife, mother, and chauffeur, um, a Cub Scout den leader, a hula hooper, a travel lover. And if you look at me, I, I would call myself more of an influencer and an advocate. So I'm the person behind the scenes whispering in people's ears, trying to slowly push the crowd a few steps closer to the middle. Um, so let's go to the next slide. My journey was very different from Catherine's um, and you'll see later uh, what happened once our paths converged. So I joined Kohler in 2016 and created what we called at the time the female advisory board. So I was doing advanced development within toileting engineering and the desire was to bring female insights to project teams and inventors um, in order that you know, we might start touching on taboo topics such as menstruation and various things women take care of in the bathroom, but we don't talk about. Um, 
Then in 2018, Kohler did something new. So Kohler has a stewardship pillar and an organization called Innovation for Good, where they're trying to proliferate technology to benefit the world. And in 2018, they started a competition called iPrize. And the uh, event is essentially very much like a Shark Tank event. Teams are able to innovate and come up with concepts and pitch them to executives. And the prize is either seed money um, to continue your journey or being picked up as an actual project within our, our, our project schedule. So I participated on a team that was looking at menstrual health management around keeping girls in developed nations in school. Um, eventually we decided not to recommend taking that concept forward for Kohler. And in fact, if you look me up on LinkedIn, there's an article about failure um, if you Google my name, but we were able to turn this around in a positive way in terms again of, of influence. So we were able to take this opportunity to advocate female-centered design within Kohler for products and processes. And we were able to take the menstrual health issue a little further in terms of advocating improvements in various technologies that Kohler could, could approach. So I'm going to turn this back over to Catherine. Okay, so let's wake up and I know some of you, it looks like are already answering our next question, but turn back to your mentee and feel free to weigh in on you know, before we get into our business resource group and specifically gendered innovations, kind of want to get a feel for where your efforts are within your own employee resource groups, affinity groups, business resource groups. Yeah, um, and let us add, BRG is a Kohler term, business resource group. It, it, it's the Kohler term for ERG. Yeah, I know some other companies- We'll use them interchangeably here yeah. just, just so that we're all using common, yeah. common lingo. Look at all the dots. I love this visual, so fun. A lot of professional development, mentorship, membership, yep, and wellness. Okay. Oh, I would be really interesting. Um, for those of you who answered other, if you would pop that in the chat, um, just because I would love to know what else you're doing in your BRG that's not captured in these buckets. It would be great if you would do that. Um, so, okay. It's looking like people are finding places for their efforts um, and you know, product strategy being, being the minority. So exciting. I hopefully will um, be able to make sure that you have something coming away from this uh, presentation. Thanks for sharing with us some of your focus areas. So let's get grounded in the story of where this whole journey started. Um, starting with what was the state of maturity for diversity, equity, and inclusion at Kohler Company when you know, Jennifer and I kind of started to cross paths. Um, goals were established at a global level. Percent female representation was a focus and we were as a company tracking hiring promotions and retention of diverse talent. There was of course other efforts going into that, but just to give you like Kohler was out of the business case portion and already into the executing portion. Some programming had rolled out diverse slates criteria and hiring, executive level awareness training was happening on a, a regular basis, and inclusion training was available for associates that wanted it. And business resource groups had begun to be established. So at that time, we had five BRGs established, and I'll give you a little more detail. But this helps you, like, so if you, depending on your employee resource group and how mature your organization is in d &I, and we wanted to give a sense of, you know, the state that Kohler was in that allowed us to, to make the progress that we feel that we've been able to make. Regarding business resource groups and knowing that you all are coming with that interest in, as a background, um, this is kind of a timeline of business resource groups. One of the things that we're hoping you'll take away from this is that they're fairly new at Kohler. Um, so they were born in 2018 and the first three where Women at Work, Proud, which is our LGBTQ uh, business resource group, and the Kohler Alliance of Veterans and Supporters. Um, so I won't go into detail on every single one of these, um, but you can see that various chapters of different business resource groups have formed over the course of the year. And I did kind of mark in here from a timeline standpoint, Women at Work KBNA was established in 2019, and it was in March 2020 that um, Gendered Innovations was formed. So a little bit of background on 
you know, even the maturity of business resource groups at Kohler. And Women at Work, specifically Kitchen and Bath North America chapter, which is um, the chapter that Jennifer and I are a part of, this is a representation of what we focus on. So we have a lot of some of the things that, that you all are focusing on as well, development and mentorship, where it's two of the more popular ones I saw coming in. I also saw wellness in there. Um, some people were saying stewardship. We do have a focus on communication as well. Um, but right here in the center, we've put gendered innovations as our little um, kind of not the, the typical type of thing, which might lead you to the question of why gendered innovations? Why did that? Why has Kohler even pursued this? Why did we think it was something that was worth looking at from a women at work business resource group? When I was in the diversity and inclusion role, um, part of what I did was to help establish the business case for um, DE&I efforts at Kohler Company. And there are a lot of different reasons. I've summarized three here on the slide, um, but the most important one for this story is number three, strength, strengthening customer orientation for consumer-based industries. And what happens when that strong customer orientation is present? I give you an example um, that Volvo did actually at the beginning of the, uh, well, in the year 2001, I think is when they started developing this, but Volvo created a Your Concept car. This is where a team of women uh, put in design features for the modern consumer. So not necessarily uh, designed by women for women, but designed by women for the modern consumer is how they thought of it. And they really put a focus on the pain points that women would typically experience in purchasing an automobile, in using an automobile, um, something that is typically very technical and daunting and for anyone. Um, but really trying to make it approachable and feature rich for women. This was um, a model car. And some of the features they incorporated, there was no hood, no hood. How are you supposed to put your windshield washer fluid in? Well, they actually put the windshield washer fluid fill next to the gas fill. Um, and the maintenance was regular, you know, low maintenance, long maintenance cycles. They even had, I thought this picture was amazing, hanging um, interchangeable, feet, like imagine just being able to snap out your seat covers um, so that you can change out the aesthetic of the vehicle. So a lot of really unique and interesting features that Volvo really made a splash in the market with when they started touring this model car um, in the industry. But this is what strong customer orientation looks like as they were taking on their, their goal of attracting more female consumers. But what happens when customer orientation is lacking, Jennifer? Why don't you take us through okay. a few examples? So I'm going to take us through a few examples. Some of these you'll probably know about. So Apple Health Kit. Um, Apple launched this in 2014. Uh, there was a lot of press about it. Incredible tracking features for health, for fitness data. Unfortunately, they forgot about periods. Um, you know, menstruation is obviously a critical health factor for women. Women noticed, um, yet it still took Apple roughly a year to come out with a version that included a period tracking feature. So let's go to the next one. The next one, um, this is an interesting case. So this is a drug by the name of Addy. It was promoted as the Viagra for women. Um, Ironically, it was largely tested on men. So 92% of the population that it was tested on were male. Um, and one of the side effects was it lowered blood pressure. So it got a lot of negative press um, in the sense that, you know, we learned that women, because of lower body mass than men, when they took this drug and combined it with alcohol, they tended to faint or pass out. Um, so, so here's, here's an odd example, and this is actually pretty common in the drug testing industry for years and years, women were omitted from drug testing because we're messy. They didn't want our menstrual cycles messing up their data. Um, now women are mandatory, but not in large percentages. And here is a, a really strange way that it played out in a drug intended for women. Let's go to the next one. So this this one, I like this one. This one's just fun. This is a recent example. So pinky glove. Um, this year, a couple of German entrepreneurs uh, went to a Shark Tank-like television show, and they won 30,000 euros in funding for their concept. 
Um, the concept is a pink glove that comes individually packaged in a little cardboard pouch like you see on the left. You can use it to change out your used uh, menstrual health products, and then you can roll them up inside that glove and dispose of them in the garbage can. Um, ironically or interestingly, the German tampon market is an applicator-free market. Those are the products they prefer. German women took exception to pinky glove. They made it very clear that they didn't feel like this was an unmet need for them. Um, they took offense to what they felt was period shaming and the product was quickly pulled from the market. So now we're, we're gonna move slightly to a different venue talking about representation. And we know that we're preaching to the choir a bit already. You're, the fact that you're here listening to us today tells us that you understand representation matters, um, but we're gonna talk about how that plays out in a couple of important areas. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So first in politics, and you'll be saying, why are you talking to us about politics? So we're gonna talk about governmental politics for a moment, but think about how this could play out within your workplace or within the volunteer organizations with which you participate. So. Um, female representation in politics is important. Um, studies have shown that women tend to prioritize bills that deal with women's issues and with children and family issues. And simply having a few women in an appropriate spot makes a big difference. So let's go to the next slide. I'll give you a couple examples what we mean by this. So on the left side, uh, here's an example of women prioritizing. So it's well known that women in the US military are at a higher risk of injury due to ill-fitting body armor. Um, body armor is made for males. Women use this typically the smallest size that they can find. It doesn't fit them appropriately or correctly. Unfortunately, it simply hasn't been a priority in terms of spending to have gendered protective equipment until this year. So this year, a couple of female Congresswomen who happened to have military experience along with a male peer introduced uh, in a spending bill, uh, essentially funding to try to make this happen, make this a reality for our female service members, which, which is a great thing. That's what, positive, that's what good could look like. On the right side, here's what not having a seat at the table can look like. So, Think back to last year, so March, it's March 2020, countries are starting to shut down due to COVID. And in India, uh, politicians didn't put sanitary pads on their list of essential items. So those factories shut down along with all of the other non-essential businesses. Within about two days, the sanitary pad supply in India was exhausted. So you couldn't, you couldn't find them on the shelves anymore. Pharmacies, stores, and women's groups quickly raised the red flag and, and alerted the government. It got added to the essential item list a few days later, but it still took roughly another week in order to restart those factories. And because of workforce interruptions, supply chain disruptions, et cetera, when they reopened, they were at significantly reduced capacity. So this shortage went on for a long, long time. And this is the kind of simple thing that can happen when women aren't represented. So let's go to the next slide. So now a little closer to, to where Catherine and I work, if you will, is representation in STEM, um, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math. There was a study fairly recently looking at modern US patents and doing some gendered analysis. And what they found was that teams that had female inventors were more likely to have patents that benefited female consumers versus all male teams. Incidentally, um, teams with female inventors patented male focused ideas at similar rates. Um, but if you think about the implications of this, um, the gap in representation in STEM for women essentially means that a lot of ideation inventing that would benefit women, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in products that are improve our daily lives, aren't happening because of the gap in representation. So let's go to the next slide. Um, 
they did a little trending. So I guess the good news is, you know, the proportion of women who are patenting is increasing. Um, it's increasing at a, at a slow rate, as you'd expect. They are predicting at the current rate that we'll have uh, IP parity, if you will, by the year 2070. But what does that mean in the workplace right now? So let's go to the next slide. In the numbers, and this data is for the US workplace only. Um, these are not graduating engineers. These are incumbent engineers working as engineers. Roughly 13% of engineers are women. Um, if you drill that down a little bit to black women, for example, that number is less than 2%. At the same time, uh, industrial designers are only faring slightly better. They're at about 19%. So there are a couple quotes up here, which you're perfectly capable of reading. But one that I really love um, is we design for what we know, right? Whether we like to admit it or not, we all have inherent bias and women as well, right? So we discussed what happens when you have women in politics, when you have women inventors, we tend to invent for things we know. So a question that you can ask yourself is while we're waiting for the year 2070 to occur, right? And, and women are, are taking more and more roles within STEM careers. What can we do to try to grow the number of inventions that can happen or ideas that will benefit women in the meantime, or we're waiting for all that to occur, right? So now we're, yeah. <laughs> Some of you may be frustrated like this, right? We we get frustrated by this at a reasonable. This is how we feel, right? Right. In the past. Um, we're gonna. We've talked about a lot of stuff. We're gonna start pulling it all, it all together and start talking about okay. At, at, within our journeys at this point, Catherine and my paths have have started to cross. And where did we go from here? And and how did that uh, play out within our BRG? Yeah, so I'll hand it over to Catherine. So exactly. And this was us, you know, at this picture, I just love it because it's like, this is us at how do we move? Like, how do we actually try to make progress in this space knowing it's a pain point? Um, and just a little um, more background to get us a little more grounded. While I was in the diversity and inclusion role, I came across this, um, this department at Stanford University called Gendered Innovations. This is an inspiration for the name. And they really focused on a methodology, a sex and gender uh, methodology for design. And what that means, of course, is that they're looking at um, that both sex and gender and the inherent traits associated with those things, how you might, um, in their case, they're often looking at the safety repercussions of not designing for women. Um, but this could also be pivoted to say, how could you gain business um, success by specifically meeting the unmet needs of women? Um, this was a fairly academic resource and difficult to industrialize. I remember I had, I had floated it by our vice president of engineering at the time, and it was hard for people to grasp onto. And so with this kind of concept in mind, knowing that those models existed, where, you know, where did Jennifer and I want to start? We had started, you know, explaining or talking and this agreeing that we wanted to figure out how we could start incorporating different perspectives in general into in a more systemic way in the new product development process. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, I should, I should caveat this to say, Kohler is obviously a very well-established consumer products industry. And so this wasn't that they were not already doing efforts in this space. This was Jennifer and I as engineers saying there could be a more systematic approach to what we were doing in new product development. Um, and so where did we want to start? We decided that we wanted to start with business resource groups. As you know, business resource groups are these collective um, groups of voices that have similar backgrounds that could act as insight panels um, in, in the early stages of new product development. And so we reached out and collaborated with some of the leaders of our other business resource groups, um, including the Proud Group, including Viva uh, and, and Kohler Alliance of Veterans and Supporters um, to talk about this concept of design for inclusion and talk about the system, systematic approach that we might be able to build and how would BRGs feed into that even as a resource to our company to get 
uh, more perspective on this diverse perspective. Uh, so Jennifer and I, along with the other leads of the, the various business resource groups, built out a pitch which talked about the business case for designing for diverse markets, which might be considered niche, but when you start looking at them from a, you know, from a consumer standpoint, are quite substantial in the amount of spending power that they have. Um, and, and, and really honing in on those markets, identifying who it is in these niche markets that we I'm going to use air quotes, niche. Women are not niche. They're over 50% of the population. I'm just going to say niche. Um, who in these niche markets, you know, are we going for? What problem we're trying to solve, right? And I know that this is typically what these two go hand in hand, right? So think of this more loosely um, as a process than, than the order in which it's always happening. But how the products and services impact specific groups of end users and how we utilize these insights to delen, uh, delight the end users and consumers. Um, so, I mean, kind of like basic innovation principles, but with a very specific focus on lenses of diversity. Um, and so when we pitched this at our, business, our bathroom innovation exchange, we got good feedback. People were interested in it. It still felt a little bit too big. And the feedback that we got for the business was, okay, why don't we pilot this on, um, on something, but let's focus in on women as our primary consumer. Uh, so consumer industry, you know, some statistics for you, 70% of the decisions often are made by women, up to 90% of decisions for the home um, and buying are, are influenced by women in the United States. The numbers vary if you go around the globe, but that's what it is in the United States. And so that was what we focused in on and Jennifer and I were happy to oblige. And so we, we said, how do we bridge the gap for women? Um, and we decided to do that by, I approached our, our president of the women's group at that time and asked her, you know, can we establish a focus area within our business resource group looking at female centric design? And she said, absolutely, yes. And she actually gave us, um, the whole budget for the year, the whole budget allowance for the year, so that we could really kick it off with a with a you know a little bit of um, style. So we hosted a Kohler Gendered Innovations Hackathon. This was in March of last year, just before COVID shutdown. Uh, so this was the last in-person innovation event that I had attended prior to COVID. Um, if it was going to be that, I'm glad it was this one because it was an amazing day. And what we focused on was the female body. And so we had about 30 participants that came in, both men and women, from all over the organization, meaning not just engineers and industrial designers, but anyone who was interested in learning about innovation and talking about this problem statement. And we focused on and gave specific permission, created an environment of safety around these three areas, physical health, mental health, and yes, feminine health. We went there, we talked about all of the things that are difficult to talk about as it relates to women in the bathroom space. Um, and to help us make it a little bit more legitimate, we did bring in the Commons, who some of you might know is a, um, is a Milwaukee-based innovation, facilitation, inspiration, I don't know, huge. Um, they do such great work in this space and really legitimized our activity. We formed it into a competition, which we then um, ended with a pitch to three of our executives within Kitchen and Bath North America at the time. Um, Angela Barbie is the Vice President of Engineering for Global Faucets. Manolo Caballer uh, was the Vice President of Innovation in NPD for our fixture side. And Sean Oldenhoff, the President of Kitchen and Bath North America, who is also our executive sponsor for our women's group. We're all judges and included some quotes here for you to enjoy um, and see. But this was really, you know, an impactful event. People coming out of this event were energized. We got some great concepts out of this event. And so Gendered Innovations is born um, on March 4th, 2020 with 18 concepts and a whole lot of gumption. Uh, so you know, when we started to refine, we, we actually got some members out of that activity who participated in it, in it um, that you know, still are on our committee today. And we formalized around the mission statement to drive social progress for women through product innovation with these initial focus areas. Female-centered design to be a hub for female-centered design products, concepts, and insights. Uh, we want to push for technical and entrepreneurial confidence in our membership. So 
um, how do we build that technical capability and our female talent uh, to build confidence and business savvy, and then also to inspire others. So promote Kohler as a leader in the female-centered design area by telling our story and sharing best practice, and hopefully inspiring other diverse groups of people to have their voices be heard. Um, and Jennifer, why don't you take us through yeah. what the accomplishments have been so far? Yeah, so we've had a number of accomplishments in the last 18 months, um, and I'll kind of go through them pillar by pillar. Uh, related to female-centered design, um, interestingly, the hackathon was a great kickoff event, and it gave us essentially a seat at the table. So COVID had then quickly hit. There was a lot of um, high-level brainstorming about strategic technologies that was going on, and women started being given a seat at the table at those kind of events in order to make sure that they had a, a female lens or lenses captured. And so the net result was, was really well received, and I'm happy to state that Kohler has even uh, started filing patents based on some of these ideas that our members were able to contribute. Um, next one, so iPrize. I mentioned in my history, I participated in, in the inaugural iPrize in 2018. Um, in 2020, we actually had two business resource groups participate in that event. So the Gender Innovations group had a team and then Kohler Proud, which is our LGBTQ plus uh, BRG also participated and both teams made it to the finals. So we were very, very proud of them. Um, we routinely are reached out to from marketers, from inventors, et cetera, wanting a female lens to ideas. So we uh, try to provide and facilitate that whenever possible. Unfortunately, because of confidentiality and uh, you know, product design in process, we can't go over details, um, but the group has been instrumental in, in connecting the right people and providing the right insights there. Um, and then something I think we're really proud of that occurred this year. In quarter one, we were pulled in to help try to create a strategy around a female-centric product pipeline. And that evolved into something a little bigger. Um, we ended up creating a position description for a strategy and innovation manager of feminine care uh, that was accepted and posted. And that position was filled. Um, there's a wonderful marketing resource who took that on roughly a month ago, and she's quickly coming up to speed and, and starting to roll up her sleeves and, and get into this space. So we're really excited about working with her in the future. Let's go to the next slide. So technical and entrepreneurial confidence. We had some plans in mind, but COVID, frankly, completely derailed that. And so we had to regroup and think what we might be able to accomplish. And so one idea we came up with was what we were calling a STEAM Skillshare. So STEAM, in this case, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, you know, we found because of COVID, everybody was staying home. A lot of people were doing home improvements. A lot of people were doing stretch projects that they might not have been willing or able to attempt because they had extra time on their hands. And so we challenged our members to kind of share non-traditional projects that they had taken on um, and results of those in order to kind of boost entrepreneurial and technical confidence. So here are a couple of, of uh, the shares that we received. So on the left, um, we had a gendered innovation committee member who was up in project leadership, she did not have a technical background. And she said, normally she would have had her husband and teenage son working on this project. They were updating all of the switch plates in their home, um, but she decided she wanted to take on that challenge. And so she ended up doing that large project herself. Um, if you look on the right, I think that's actually Catherine. So Catherine was building a structured woodshed with a roof. She got she got tired of looking out of her window at the tarp over her wood pile. So uh, oh, I learned some roofing and other carpentry skills there. Um, so so that was one method we took in terms of you know doing things virtually and kind of adjusting in this in the COVID world. 
Um, another thing we did, or oh, hold on. Um, sorry, Jim. So, so as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, we had two BRG teams make it to our I, I prize finals. The the Kohler Proud team um, had a concept that was also fairly female centric, um, and the team was largely made of you know non engineers and people who were not in the product development space, and so we were able to align one of our committee members with them and help them and actually bring them into a prototyping space within the building so that they could do um, some kind of design thinking for an ergonomic prototypes to better support their concept and their final pitch there. Um, so, you know, again, supporting entrepreneurial and technical confidence. And then we can go to the last one. So lastly, inspire others um, has been a general theme that, that we've been trying to achieve as well. Um, we've had a number of opportunities to present either internally at Kohler or externally. Um, related to iPrice, again, it seems like that's all I talk about. Uh, we, we did kind of step up and decided to do a call to action to the other BRGs to try to promote that event and enlist as many diverse ideas and diverse teams as possible. So. Um, we actually had the Commons come in and facilitate a brainstorming event that was BRG focused to help those teams grow since they you know, largely were participants who weren't necessarily in normal product development space. So um, then something new we've been doing this year is what we're calling quarterly Women's Health Ideas Summit. So ideas stands for innovation, design, education, advocacy, and synergy. So we've been bringing in companies that are focused specifically on improving women's health through technologies. Many of them are female founded and we've been having them talk to us quarterly um, in order to kind of inform and inspire our members. So that, that's been going well. And then finally, kind of a fun event we did this year was around Menstrual Hygiene Day, which is at the end of May. So we had a virtual event where we watched it and discussed a documentary and we sent out materials so that members could make period bracelets while they were watching, you know, the documentary. And there's a, a little photo where, you know, we made our period bracelets, everybody sent in their, their photo and we kind of made a collage out of that. So that was well received and, you know, we felt was pretty important in terms of celebrating women's health and trying to reduce the stigma around menstruation. So current focus areas. Um, these are some things that were our works in progress. Frankly, um, we're working on these through end of the year, probably some of these into early next year as well. Um, related to female-centered design, we're trying to build a cross BRG female insights panel. So as I mentioned, we're frequently tapped to try to provide feedback or you know, answer surveys, questionnaires for marketing. Um, we're well aware that you know, there are lots of intersections that have different viewpoints. So black females, Latin females, LGBTQ plus females, et cetera. Um, so we've been working collaboratively with the other BRGs to look for volunteers who self-identify as female and are willing to participate in providing insights, doing you know, on-site product testing if they're local. Um, but I'd say this, this is where COVID has been a bit of a blessing for us in terms of uh, remote work and, and being able to participate remotely and get all those diverse voices. Um, we're also looking forward again, as I mentioned, to supporting our feminine care strategy person who's onboarded. Um, in terms of technical and entrepreneurial confidence, someday when we're returning to the workplace, um, our goal is to utilize a makerspace location within our model shop so that people can, can learn um, you know, prototyping skills and use that space. And then in terms of inspiring, um, we're working on something that we're calling menstrual equity at Kohler. Um, so there is a New York Congresswoman uh, who around menstrual health day this year was promoting a bill around menstrual equity. And, and one, of, one of the items in her bill is for large employers to provide free menstrual health supplies in their restrooms. 
So we're actively working right now to try to make that a reality on the Kohler Campus West restrooms here in Wisconsin. Um, you know, someday we would like to expand that within our other manufacturing locations within the US and eventually worldwide is really our goal there. So now I'm gonna hand it back to Catherine to kind of close it out. Um, we've got kind of a call to action for you. Yeah, thanks Jennifer. So we've been busy at it, staying the course, and now is our call to action to you all. Um, understanding that this may not apply directly to your business, um, I guess our challenge statements that we're issuing today are where can unique voices of your BRG be harnessed to drive impact? How can you turn your advocacy, ad, advocacy into tangible value propositions for your business? And this can come in different forms. If you're focused on recruiting, you know, or retention, right? Business resource groups, employee resource groups are key levers for retention within a business. How are you quantifying, you know, what that retention looks like today and how your business resource group is, is really um, helping mitigate some of that cost? So, Try to think outside of the bounds of, of products and services development. Please think inside of those bounds if they apply. But we would also challenge you to look be, beyond behavior change and think about how you can implement processes and ensure inclusion is accounted for. Um, that's a story that we hope that you take away from this or a point is that we know behavior change is important, but behavior change is also slow. And so in, in the, while we're waiting for behaviors to shift and culture to shift, what can we be doing to make it easier to do the right things um, for the customer, for the business in the meantime? And at the end of the day, let's remember that when unique voices are united in a common cause, they can make history from Ms. Ms. Gloria Steinem. And with that, we will start to take questions, which I see are already rolling in. Um, so I know you can thumbs up things and I don't have access to the chat at the moment either. Janet, keep me uh, honest if there's some questions that we want to start with before we get to these. Okay, I will. Um, and actually the first question that was put in the chat, I did send it through Minty. So it's there. Oh, great. Okay, yes. okay. All right. Um, so Jennifer, it looks like we have six questions. Let's see if we can get them all answered. Um, how did you get business leaders to see the value of BRG involvement? Um, I'll let you take that one, Catherine. Oh, <laughs> I, so I think, I think that our business leaders saw the value of business resource groups in general as being a place of community for people who are underrepresented. Um, how did we get them to see the value of BRG involvement in product development? Honestly, it's been a story of persistence and, and making and meeting commitments. Um, that's, how, that's what I would say is really it's awareness in any change management process, right? Awareness is the first step. And so talking about it and talking about the opportunity and giving examples um, within the business of where we could be doing better and how we could be doing better has been a big part of how we started with that awareness. Um, always approaching it, the topic with respect, knowing that Kohler is well-established as a consumer product um, manufacturer and, and really looking at it as an opportunity for improvement and not saying that we're doing things wrong per se. Right, I would add to that, speaking to it in terms of untapped markets and untapped opportunities for growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but tying bottom line value into a, a community was a big selling point that also legitimizes the business resource group in a different way. Mm -hmm. Whoops, let me go to the next one. Um, okay, who are your members? Are they all women or have you engaged men as well in your efforts? Um, we have about 300 members that are, exist in our chapter and there are four other chapters of women at work throughout the business in different business units. They are not all women. Um, we also engage men, but to be honest, allyship is an area of opportunity for our business resource group and something that um, we're actively trying to figure out. I would say that we have this, we have support in the executive levels with our executive sponsors uh, or sponsor um, in Sean, 
and in other leaders uh, within our business units, but we have more traction to gain from an allyship standpoint. Jennifer, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add from the Gender Innovations Committee standpoint, we're a small committee. I think there are six of us. We are all female. You know, we would welcome any male ally who, who'd like to join the cause. Um, we're not all engineers or industrial designers. You know, we, we have very passionate members who come from customer service or accounting or project leadership, um, other areas of the business. So good ideas can come from anywhere. Passion can come from anywhere. Okay. How do you take trans women and other gender identities into account in your BRD strategy? Candidly, cross-sectionality and intersectionality um, is something that we continue to want to build on. Um, so as it relates to helping trans women, um, you know, I would just say that our efforts focus on, you know, menstruators and um, also people who identify as women, whether trans or not. Um, and so we have not taken a specific lens uh, to trans women yet, um, but I think that it is a huge opportunity area. Jennifer, anything to- Yeah, add? and I, we're hopeful that we'll, we'll get that lens through our volunteer base on the female insights panel. You know, yeah. we're specifically recruiting from our LGBTQ plus BRG and looking for people who self-identify mm -hmm. as, as female, so. And we were excited that um, Kohler Proud did present their concept at iPrize as a um, non-binary concept and focused specifically on this, you know, the menstruation, right, as, as the, the topic. So we know that they're helping lead the charge in um, pioneering comfort around those topics. All right. Not a question, I want to comment you both for your, oh, commend both you. of you for your persistence and passion. Thank you <laughs> to make your workplace and the world better. Thank you. Sometimes you need a, like you're doing the right thing. You need kind of job sometimes, right, Jennifer? So thank you for that. Uh, oh, there was a test. Thank you for that. Mark is answered. What was your HRBRG support team involved? Um, not really. Um, you know, I think that our HR BRG support team, we interact with them in the form of red flag council um, and get gut checks from them. But honestly, their support, okay, I shouldn't say that. Their support came in the form of advocating for this message to be heard. Yeah, I had forgotten about this. Advocating for our message to be heard with the Kohler leadership team, which is David and his um, direct report, uh, sorry, our CEO, David Kohler and his direct uh, reports. And they also, um, you know, when I have issued recommendations or things that we need from a budgetary standpoint for this, they, they approve us. So they didn't necessarily help in, in planning out the strategy, but they have been our advocates as we, um, continue to build this work stream and focus area within, within our BRG. And we, I would add, we do obviously have HR associates who are part of our BRG as well. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we do. Um, involved in like professional development and whatnot too. So very strong contributors. All right. Um, do you have additional BRGs? If so, how have you implemented intersectionality with your efforts? So I think we answered some of these questions. Yeah. We do have other BRGs, many. Um, I think eight or nine different BRGs within the company. And we continue to reach out to them uh, to bring in that an intersectional lens and also inspire them to add their own voice to the new product yeah. development. I'll, I'll add, I also served on the development committee of Women at Work for a while, and we have done a couple of um, intersectionality type events, and there are obviously tons of opportunities to do more. Um, but last year we had a, an event on intersectionality related to violence against black women um, mm -hmm. that was very well received. So women at work um, and black catalysts collaborated to do that event as kind of a, a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and then this year as well, we collaborated with Kohler Proud, our LGBTQ plus organization. Um, Kohler is a sponsor of the Manchester United 
a soccer franchise, if you will, and the head coach of the uh, female soccer team is part of the LGBTQ plus community. So we had a, a joint program um, where we had her speak about, you know, her leadership experiences and challenges um, related to her, you know, aspects of diversity. So, um, so we have done a couple, and like I said, there are plenty of opportunities to do more. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. We have some intersectional efforts planned for next year as well, um, an intersectional women's conference. Uh, that we're, we have in the works as well. So excited to see what comes there and trying to be very intentional about involving other BRGs. Um, okay, do your ERG BRG leaders do this part-time on the side or part of their day job? Or do they get a gap year to focus on leading? Oh, interesting, a gap year. I've never heard of that. Oh, uh, wow, um, that would be cool. No, this is uh, very much a, a labor of love for many of the leaders within the BRG. For me in particular, um, I had negotiated a 10% allotment of my time during my normal work week to focus on BRG efforts, uh, which my leadership supports. And I, but I know, and Jennifer, I don't know what your- I would say it varies. I think I had negotiated between two and 5%. Oh, you know, some people are able to fit it in, others do it in their free time. Um, yeah. It really I, varies person to person and kind of kind of based on their contribution. And, and also, um, I think that this is a growth area for women, the business resource groups in general, not just the women's group at Kohler, but setting that precedence of like, this is something that is valuable to Kohler company and should be in your goals and should be accounted for. I, based on the conversations I have with other leaders within the women's group and outside of the women's group and other BRGs, this is a harder one to put boundaries around. Um, but something that I think is, is very needed. I love the idea of a gap year to focus on leading the BRG. <laughs> I mean, that, that would for how many times have I said, I wish that this could just be a day job. <laughs> but um, no, because there's plenty of work to do, right? I mean, there's plenty of work to do, but it's a great question, thank you. I think we have one more. How do you ensure that one or two women are not speaking for all women? Oh, this is such a good question. How do you ensure a diverse women perspective when tapped for insight? So I love this question because, and we didn't say it overtly, um, this group of women are not meant to speak for all women. This group of women are advocating for all women. And so that might mean that you know we're looking at that's one of the reasons that we you know justified an, a role specifically within category strategy to focus on building out a female centric concept globally um, or portfolio globally because we know that we don't represent the voices of all women um, but we do have the passion to make sure that those voices are heard jennifer anything to add i would just say you know it's kind of our job as well as connectors so you know, Catherine and I or others cannot participate in every single brainstorming event, or we can't be tapped for every single opinion. Obviously, we don't speak for all women. Um, but what we try to do is serve as connectors to, to meet those needs in terms of, oh, you know, we need to speak with women who may be, you know, premenopausal or menopausal related to some concepts and ideas. Okay. You know, we may or may not be that, but we can connect you to the right people. Or, you know, we need a Black female perspective. We obviously aren't that, but we can connect you to the right people. So that's really our job. Our job is not to speak for all women. We can't represent all women, but we can, we at least are dangerous enough at this point that we know some right questions and some probing questions and can usually, um, influence and connect. Yeah, good question. So that concludes our story and thank you for your questions. It's so hard being in a virtual audience. I don't, I'm hoping yeah, that- we don't get the visual feedback. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'll stop my share here. We don't get that visual feedback, but hopefully you all found and, and were interested in the content that we had to share in the story. and. If you ever, you know, want to learn more or continue the conversation, you can always reach out to Jennifer or I on LinkedIn. Um, and then our email addresses are also included here for your reference. So, yeah.
Janet, anything else? Yes. No, Catherine and Jennifer, thank you so much for your awesome presentation and just showing the great work that you're doing and the advocacy that you have within your organization. I want to thank all of our audience participation, the our engagement, the information you were putting in the chat. We hope that um, this has sparked some ideas for you and that you've enjoyed yourself. We want to definitely um, invite you to our next quarterly session, which we'll be sending out that information as well. But thank you again this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.